America has a strange relationship with sex. We're obsessed with it, but it terrifies us. We censor it because it's constantly being shoved down our throats. But our dirty little secret is we like things shoved down our throats, especially when we're in bondage or we're wearing leather or being slapped around a little bit. And, oh, God. Mm. <clears throat> I'm Sunny Megatron. Join Ken Melvoinberg and I as we explore, dissect, and demystify American sex. Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. American Sex with Ken Melvoin Berg and Sonny Megatron. And now, this week's episode of Stranger, Th- I mean, Weirder Occurrences. Hi, 1983, Kenny. Thanks for running this Dungeons and Dragons games for us. You know, you're a great dungeon master for only being 14 years old. And and I'm 12 and I have a big crush on you, but I'll never let you know because I think you're way too cool for me. Sonny, you dweeb. Pay attention to the D&D game we're playing. (laughs) Okay, sorry. sorry. Okay, Okay. Next, you open the door and you send something dark and creepy coming from beyond. Oh god, holy crap, is it the Demogorgon? No, but it's something you never expected. Never expected. I know, is it like a Cabbage Patch doll? Those are really hard to get. You know, Cindy's mom camped out overnight to get one, and then when the store opened, she got into a big fight with Jane's mom, and she punched her in the nose, and she never got the Cabbage Patch doll. I don't care about the damn Cabbage Patch dolls. Roll for initiative. Don't say damn. Hold on, let me take a sip of my Crystal Pepsi. Why don't you try new Coke? It's so much better. Ugh, oh, oh, I rolled a 19. That's good. You go first, Sonny. What are you going to do? Okay, so for my first action, I want to find out what this is that we've come upon in the dungeon. So since I'm a wizard, I cast a clairvoyance spell. What you see is a little bit confusing. There's a swirling cloud of gray ahead of you, but it opens up and it's not a monster at all. In fact, it appears to be you and I sitting at a desk with headphones on and a microphone in front of us. What? I have a beard and a bunch of tattoos and your boobs are huge. Uh, Oh my God. On a scale of one to ten, you're an eleven but I have more hair. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have some sort of a space age machine. It's like a Commodore 64, but it's thin and sleek with a color screen. It's not even amber. It's the year 2017 and Donald Trump is president. What? Donald Trump? You mean like that boring looking full of himself business guy that drives a DeLorean? You know, I see his pictures the guy in Tiger Beat magazine, he's partying with Duran Duran trying to look cool and I can never figure out why he's there hanging out with pop stars because he's like in a suit and sees some boring wannabe businessman guy. That guy? That Donald Trump? He's the president? Well, I suppose if Ronald Reagan can be president, anyone can, can he, right? Well, I don't know about that. It looks like we're using a fancy personal home computer box to talk to a former Surgeon General of the United <laughs> States. What? Is it, wait, isn't that a person that writes the warning on the packs of cigarettes? Like, don't smoke or you'll have three-eyed babies, right? I see it when I buy cigarettes from the corner store for my mom. She sends me with a note and I buy the cigarettes for 99 cents. That Surgeon General? What the hell are we talking to the Surgeon General about, Kenny? We are talking about, oh my God. What? We're talking about sex. What? <laughs> sex? I can't say it a lot. S-E-X? With the three X's? Yes. Kind of S. Not, not six. We're talking about sex. And, and we're talking about masturbation. What? Masturbation. What? Masturbation. Stop saying it! No! No! This is so grody. Like, gab me with a spoon. Masturbation makes you grow hair on your palms. And, like, you ruin yourself. And it's... Ugh, ugh. 
Ugh. No, Sonny, it's not grody at all. Unless you're masturbating under the covers, then your mom comes up because you're jacking off and she thinks you're reading a book and hits your dick with a flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> Are you trying to tell me something funny did that happen to you? And you won't grow hair in your palms. Suddenly, there's a puff of smoke. You hear an ominous voice that fills the room, and it says, You show great courage. Ooh, you... Damn it. <laughs> so, suddenly, there's a puff of smoke. You hear an ominous voice that fills the room, and it says, You show great courage, young wizard. I bestow upon you one magic item. <laughs> now roll an eight-sided dice to see what item you get. Kenny, how did you get such a deep manly voice? Is it from masturbating? <laughs> Apparently they're getting my dick hit by my mom with a flashlight while I was jacking off and she thought I was reading a book. <laughs> okay, let me roll the dice. I don't want to think about your dick. Or maybe I do because I have a crush on you. Oh, I rolled a seven. <laughs> <laughs> Wizard, you have earned a very special magic wand. It is the Wonder O Wand by what? Castle Megastore. What? Read the note attached to it. What? Okay, let me read the note. Give me give me the book. Give me the handbook. Okay. The Wonder O Wand is the most powerful in the land. And it's here to teach you a valuable lesson. As you will learn in the future. Masturbation is not grody. It's a healthy part of human sexuality. Oh, God. Okay. <sighs> the Wonder O Wand is cordless and it has more than 20 charges. It has infinite charges because it's rechargeable. That it has, is truly magical. It is. It has multiple speeds and patterns and an easy to clean all silicone head. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds cool. And its intensity rivals the most powerful wands in all the land. And it's available at CastleMegastore.com. Um, for, for wait, it says a dungeon. Kenny, it says a dungeon master should roll a twenty-sided dice here. So I am going to roll this twenty-sided dice to determine what percentage off we get, and I roll a natural twenty. Yay! You get to crit on your Castle Mega Store purchase of the Wonder O Wonder anything you buy at Castle Mega Store when you use the code Sunny S U N N Y at checkout. And I don't even know what that means because it's 1983 and we don't have the internet. Al Gore hasn't invented yet. And we certainly don't have any rechargeable cordless vibrating massagers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, all right, Ken, this concludes our episode. And listener, this concludes our episode. Oh, wait, wait, what? Let's call it weird occurrences. Yes. Not stranger, stranger things, things because, because of copyrights and all that stuff. Yes. <laughs> Um, but really, the Wonder O Wand is one of Ken and my favorite, favorite sex toys, and you really can get 20% off that and almost anything you order at CastleMagnetStore.com with code SUNNY, S-U-N-N-Y. And also, we both love the Wonder O Wand so much, we have teamed up with Castle Megastore to give one away. All you have to do is go to SunnyMegatron.com backslash wand giveaway and use the contest widget to enter, and there's no purchase necessary. Entry period ends on October 31st, 2017, Halloween. And you can get additional entries each day, which means more chances for you to win. So get get entering right now. And Castle Megastore has one more giveaway for you, too. Win an Angela White fleshlight and a signed copy of the adult film, Angela Loves Women 3, signed by Abella Danger and Angela White. You are never not going to be like... <laughs> <laughs> About Abella Danger and her ass? That's yes. true, I am not. All right, this giveaway also runs through the end of the month. Go to CastleMegastore.com to enter, or you can find the link to both of these giveaways in our show notes. Thank you, Castle. No, seriously, though, listeners, I turned to Ken the other night out of the blue and I was like, so what would you think if at, at 13 somebody told you as a grown up, you would use like your magic flicker box to talk with a former Surgeon General about sex while Donald Trump was president? I thought that a magic flicker box was something you bought at Castle Megastore. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, what? but I, I would have never guessed that any of that would have happened at all. In fact, right now I feel kind of like our current government is like we're in a space time continuum flux and we're on the wrong end of it. So, uh, but we have an amazing opportunity and we are having a, a conversation with somebody who's one of my personal heroes, Dr. Joycelyn Elders, former Surgeon General of the United States. And if you're not familiar with Dr. Elders, just wait, you're about to be as thrilled as we are. So Surgeon General Dr. M. Joycelyn Elders was the 16th United States Surgeon General. She was the first African-American and second woman to ever hold the position. Dr. Elders grew up in rural segregated Arkansas and was the daughter of a sharecropper. She attended an all-black school 13 miles from home and frequently took off weeks at a time to help her family work in the cotton fields. When she graduated high school, which was remarkable for a poor African-American woman growing up in the South at that time, she earned a university scholarship and found her calling was in medicine. After joining the Army and then attending medical school, elders became a well-respected pediatric endocrinologist. Now, this is where her passion for comprehensive sex education took root. Pregnancy was dangerous for teenage girls with diabetes and other illnesses, and elders recognized the need to give these young women clear, usable information on pregnancy prevention and sexuality education. She taught these young women not to be ashamed of their sexual feelings, but instead have agency over their own bodies and to approach their own sexuality with intelligence and responsibility. Then in 1986, then Governor Bill Clinton named elders the director of the Arkansas Department of Health. She fought with conservative and religious opponents and open clinics and schools. She made condoms and comprehensive sex education available to children and teens. And in 1993, she was appointed Surgeon General of the United States under then President Bill Clinton. After 15 months, she was forced to resign when she made an unforgettable remark to the press after speaking to the United Nations for the World AIDS Day Conference. She was asked if the spread of AIDS could be reduced through advocating masturbation as an alternative to sexual intercourse. Dr. Elders answered, I think that is something that is a part of human sexuality and it's a part of something that perhaps should be taught. She was already controversial for speaking up about comprehensive sex ed, birth control, and supporting the legalization of marijuana, and that was just too much for that time. President Clinton forced her to step down while he was getting blowies in the Oval Office. Uh, oops, did I say that out loud? Yes, you did. <laughs> uh, elders went back to medicine and teaching and has since retired. She is, however, very vocal about the importance of sexuality education, and she has discussed in the following interview. But before we play that for you, please make sure you subscribe to American Sex Podcast on iTunes or whatever platform you listen to podcasts on. And also, please leave us a review. And here is Dr. Joycelyn Elders. You're kind of a hero to both my wife and myself. I'm a former military guy that was in medical, and I had a little sister that passed away due to complications of diabetes. Oh. So I can't tell you how much the work that you do has influenced the both of us, and we're both sex educators, and that's partly due to the influence that you had in our lives. So we just wanted to say a personal thank you, and we think you're a rock star. What the hell? Gee. <laughs> yeah, it's flattering will get you everywhere. Oh, wonderful. Hello, Dr. Elders. I'm ah! Sunny. I'm Ken's wife. As he said, we're both sexuality educators. We work together. We do our little podcast radio show together. And I just want to say that I am absolutely thrilled to be speaking with you as well. It is a great honor. And, you know, back in the early 90s, I was in college and it was way before I had any inkling that I was going to one day be a sexuality educator. And you left such a positive and affirming impression on me. Yes, but thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. You, you know, your no nonsense, tell it like it is approach to sexuality education was absolutely revolutionary to me. And, and as a young woman growing up in the 80s was exactly what I needed to hear. And I just want to thank you for that. It, thank it, you. You really did change the trajectory of my life. And when you did get flack and criticism for being so open and tell it like it is, instead of making me feel deflated as a woman, it lit a fire under me to be honest, to get positive sexuality education out there, to get comprehensive sexuality education out there. So I want to thank you for that. Well, thank you very much. You know, and I think we have to. Uh, we've got to. We've got to grow up with the fact that, you know, sexual healthy sexuality education. It you know, it's about 
healthy sexuality. You know, it's because of our ignorance that we've turned it into you know, something dark or something that we look back on. But it just, it's, you know, in order to be healthy, we need to have good sexual, mental, emotional, physical, social, behavioral sexuality or healthy sexuality. You grew up in Arkansas. You were born yes. in the 1930s. A few days ago. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but what lit a fire under you? Because you grew up, I'm sure, in an environment where things were whispered about, and not talked about, and were shameful. So how did you become what you are now? You, you know, when you ask me how did I become what I am now, you, you know, you don't ever know. But lots of things influence uh influence you. You know, I think probably what pushed me the most was when I began, well, was health director at Arkansas and was going around, you know, visiting health departments and visiting people, visiting the Delta and seeing so many bright young people, especially young girls, being used and abused and becoming parents before they became adults. I just got so upset. I couldn't sleep at night. I couldn't think. I couldn't talk. And I just felt we've got to do something about this. Yeah, yeah, and that's just how I felt. I just felt I didn't know what to do, but we had to find something to do. So everybody I talked to, I didn't care who it was. I'd meet them on the street or at church or wherever. I said, this is something. It's an insult. We can't have this continue to happen. And so... Well, then, you know, you know, when you get motivated and committed enough, well, then, you know, you, you, people talk about speaking truth to power. You don't even think about that. You go out and you start knocking on every door that you feel they can make a difference. And if they act like they don't want to make a difference, you feel, that, well, I just didn't approach them right. I've got to find out what do I say to change them over to make them realize that there's something we can do and we've got to get it done. Now, when you when you started talking and and talking honestly from your heart about these issues that people normally whispered about, right? Was it well but they received? All knew. Pardon? Was it well received or were oh, people well, but shocked? You know, well, I think mo more people were shocked, but you know, most people, I think they felt that I was right. They knew that I was right, but uh, they felt that they start talking about it, especially the politicians part of it, that 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 people wouldn't vote for them. Mm -hmm. But now, as I think, as people are learning more, and as that they are becoming wiser, they are realizing that they were selling out the most valuable resource they had, their children for short-term gains because they were afraid to speak up and their whispering and their myths and their lies was wiping out their children. I had heard you in, in an interview actually liken the lack of sex education or abstinence-only sex education as an actual form of child abuse. Is I do, I, and I still feel very strongly that way. I feel that it is child abuse. When you don't educate your child. Let them grow up ignorant and let them grow up being used and, and depraved. To me, that's child abuse. And, and, and so, um, uh, I, 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 I feel very strongly that, you know, like many, the reason why many young children, let's say the young people ask me, what do you teach children that are five, you know, five? You teach them, you teach them that there are certain places on their body. Nobody is to touch. If they do, they need to tell somebody. But what the abuser teaches them, this is our little secret, don't tell anybody. And that's what they grow up with. And right. we as parents allow it to happen. And so we abuse our children and sell them out to the child abuser. Who is responsible? I know that, you know, as someone who works for the government, you did a lot to put clinics and education and even the distribution of condoms in schools that are very, that's very yes. important. However, we also have the other side of the coin, the parents that are at home, yes. either 
maybe they want to talk to their children about sex, but they don't know how to start. And some of them downright don't want to talk about it. That's right. So where does the responsibility lie? The responsibility, I I think, allow with all of us. Our whole society has got to get busy in changing our thinking and changing our attitudes. We've all got to talk about it. We've got to talk about it at church. We've got to talk about it at schools. We've got to talk about it to their children. You know, on TV, you know, so the message that the children are always hearing is I'm a sexual being from the day I'm born till the day I die. They need to always hear and they need to be responsible. They need to be protect of their bodies, protection of their sexual health. And that they don't need to, uh, they, and, and they need, as I say, I tell people all the time, they need to understand that every sperm was not meant to be a baby. So the only reason for having sex is not for procreation, which is kind of what had been out there for ages, but we've got to protect ourselves and protect our sexual partner. And we've also, it's about pleasure. 99.99% of sex is about pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I said, I'll never forget some pilot, a group of pilots was on the plane one time and I was, but we was talking about this, and I mentioned it, and I mentioned the three P's, sexuality, procreation, protection, and pleasure. And, and, that, and I said that 99.9% of sex is about pleasure. They said, Dr. Ellers, you didn't add enough nines to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. When you start bringing up pleasure in sex education, a lot of people, they say, what do you say to a kid? You know, I remember when I went through sex education, right. when my children went through sex education, right. it was when a mommy and daddy love each other and they turn off the lights and they mm-hmm. want to make you a little brother, a little sister. Mm-hmm. And that's really not well, what it is. So see, how that, do you that, talk to kids? Well, that's, we're making a, a healthy sexuality about procreation. Mm-hmm. And see, not all sexuality is, a, we don't, every time we have sex, we aren't trying to be a baby mate. Thankfully. <laughs> well, well, no, not thankfully. And, and and we certainly don't want to get a disease or give anybody else a disease. And we certainly don't necessarily want to have a, a child. But we do, we do want to have sex. So most of sex is about pleasure. And we need to be teaching young people healthy sexuality. Mm-hmm. If they choose to be sexually active, how to make sure they protect themselves. Right. We are now, thankfully, more and more people are on board with comprehensive sex sexuality education, but we've missed the boat for a lot of the parents. Yes. We spoke at uh, the University of Tennessee recently to a group of freshmen about sexual health, mm-hmm. and we were the very first people for that class of children that had ever spoken to them in a school setting about sexuality. Right. So you have all of these parents that are now raising their own children that don't have that education. So, okay, we have a second chance with the children, but where do the parents go that missed out to catch up? You know, we we used to say, well, have them will to the church, but that we haven't taught the ministers. They don't know how. We've not. So, what we're really working very hard on is to really begin. We had a summit. I was at, at a summit on Monday in Atlanta on sexual healthy sexuality or sexual health for nurses, and we've had three summits now on sexual health education for doctors. We've not educated our doctors. Our doctors only have. Five hours of sexual health education in schools, yet we know that 38% of the sexual health, sexual and reproductive health for uh, uh, reproductive age women, it, 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 38% of health care is related to sexual and reproductive health, and yet we don't educate them. So we've got to educate our doctors, our nurses. We've got to educate our teachers, our parents. We've got to educate our entire society. And once we get our society educated, it'll be easy. Everybody will do it. But, you know, we've got to start from the beginning. And, we, you know, and we've got to educate parents. And, and, you know, when you think about it, look at how much information we can get out so very quickly on social media. And yet... 
we can't use social media for sexual help. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, your background is as a pediatric endocrinologist. That's and I correct. have to ask you, do you want to hear an endocrinologist joke? Because I only know one. All right. Let me hear that one. Okay. So I'll know it too. So if John has 32 candy bars and he eats 28 of them, what does he have? Diabetes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. That's, that's a terrible joke. Well, I'm that groaning. is a terrible joke. I that is. Groaning. That's a total dad joke. So as an endocrinologist, there's a couple of things that you specialize in, with diabetes being one of those. But the, the, the thing that I wanted to ask about that is related to uh, sexuality is that you deal with uh, different sexual chromosome disorders, um, yes. such as things involving intersex people. Now, for those yes. of our audience that don't know what intersex means, it's something that used to be called hermaphrodites. Now they're called intersex. It, and, right. it's, and it's interesting to me that 1.7% of the human population is intersex. Uh, only 0.2% of the population is Jewish. But many more people know uh, like a Jew in their life than they know somebody who is intersex. So we right. wanted to talk a little bit about okay. that if we could. All right. And you recently did a paper with two other surgeons general, if I'm not mistaken, right. a few years back. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? At, on that particular paper, we were really speak, we were talking about uh, transgender, and then we, we talked about uh, intersex. Well, if, you know, we are not 100% male or 100% female. It goes across the spectrum. In the intersex, sometimes people will have both an ovary and a testis. They may, they may be together or one may be on one side and one on the other. Over testis. And, and often they'll have, you know, if the testis, if the testis is producing excess hormone, well, you know, we, we may have uh, uh, the normal female genitalia having marked enlargement of the clitoris. And we have certain endocrine disorders, uh, like adrenogenital syndrome that, that, that will have that. But what we, now for our intersex, well, we make sure that, you know, we try and identify people uh, uh, correctly. And, and, you know, we used to feel that the parents need to decide very early and we did surgery early and we did everything early, but more and more we are moving to, we don't have to do that early unless there's a real reason and we can let the parent, patient decide because our brain is very early tells us whether we're going to be Male or female, it's imprinted very early at a very early age. Yeah, and I was, you know, and it's interesting uh, when all of these bathroom bills had come up in recent legislation, and I've always wondered, you know, how is it going to affect people that are intersex? Who, because uh, like, there's a, a few intersex people we know, and they actually the like one of the people actually identifies with both genders right. and goes back and forth. Uh, do you have any comment about the bathroom bills themselves and how they relate to this? Well, you know, I feel that the bath, you, you know, how are we going to, are we going to have people walk around with birth certificates to know about the bathroom? If people need to go to the bathroom, who is going to be worried about their sexuality unless they're in the bathroom for the wrong reasons? And and what I mean by that, you know, if you have somebody going in pretending that they're a female or male in a bathroom, you know, and they're going in for other sexual reasons, but most people are not going for that. You know, they're going to go, going to use the bathroom and then nobody's going to be concerned about their sexuality. And when you go in the stalls and close the doors, who cares? And if you're in an open stall, you know, if you're going, using it as a female, you aren't going to be going to an open stall because it's too, you know, it's too hard to, you, you know, you need to sit in. Right. And, and right. Whereas, <laughs> whereas, you know, whereas if you're male, even regardless of where you go, you know, it, nobody, you, you know, you, whether you're in the open or closed stall, you aren't going, you're going there to use the bathroom and you aren't going there to use your sex organs for other reasons. Mm -hmm. 
which is what people are hollering about. Exactly. And and now that that brings me to a whole whole nother subject is uh, you know, I felt and I don't know how, how you felt over the last few years that we were making a lot of progress when it came to transgender issues, when it comes yes. to getting comprehensive sex education yes. into schools, when it comes to reproductive rights, all of those great things. And then come last November, the brakes went on. <laughs> oh, 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 I know it. I know it. And, and it makes no sense. We we're trying to make progress, trying to move forward, and I think we're going to have to. You know, we need to. We're going to have to move forward if we're if we're going to really begin to make a real difference. And but you know, we 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 get bogged down in the minutia. And you know, far as I'm concerned, you know, I'm not concerned about who somebody else is is sleeping with, as long as they aren't abusing children, and as long as we're talking about two consenting adults. If they are, if, if and if this is their behavioral choice, whatever it is, but you know, I feel that it's none of the rest of our business. So, what what do you recommend? Again, going back to parents who mm-hmm. have kids that they're trying to raise as healthy, open, sexual beings, however sexual they want right. to be when they grow up. What do you recommend that parents do to combat? the the things that they're learning in schools. I know my, I have a daughter who's now 22 years old Mm -hmm. and she was in, when she started sex ed in fifth grade, we were in Indiana and it, she got in trouble for Mm -hmm. actually bringing up. So, you know, when the mom and the dad are are together having sex and they get pregnant, she got pulled out of class, sent to the principal's office. (sighs) They learned about HIV. They learned about STIs, but they couldn't talk about intercourse. Right. But, but which made no sense. Which makes zero sense. And see, so much of our, why we need healthy sexuality is so that we can talk to our children and have them realize that, you know, sex is wonderful, sex is good, but we need to, we, we certainly don't need to impose ourselves on, on anybody else. That's abuse. It needs to be consenting. And we need to, both partners need to respect and protect each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's what we don't teach. We just teach ignorance is bliss. Right. If they don't know about it, they won't do it. Now, you bring up a lot about abuse and consent, and that's really important, you know, talking about consent, even as little kids, you know, it, from that's right. go hug your auntie. No, I don't want to. You know, we yes. teach kids that it's okay that their consent can be encroached upon or whatnot. Right. So it starts there. Well, now recently in the media, especially on social media in the last week, mm-hmm. we I don't know if you've heard about the, the hashtag Me Too, about sexual abuse, sexual misconduct in the workplace, that yes. sort of thing. It's yes. coming out that yes. there's been, you know, sexual misconduct in Hollywood, that but, sort of thing. And but people see, are a lot of that started years and years ago and the reason why it, it it's allowed to continue and go on is because we've not taught our young people healthy sexuality, positivity of of, of, of sexual relationships. And that we all we're sexual beings. We all want and and and, and, and enjoy sex as an important part of our growing up as as human beings. And then we need to be taught that and we need to be taught that it's and that nobody nobody has a right to impose on you you know you you know we have certain sexual rights of sex now you had talked about a few times you brought up teaching about sexuality education yes. in church yes which some people are hearing that and they're clutching their pearls like oh, in church in church absolutely so how how do you see that happening? Or has it happened? You know, Is it happening now? Yeah. Oh, well, there some churches are beginning to talk about it a little bit. You know, the highest incidence of child sexual abuse is among ministers. Mm-hmm. But that's because they have the trust, they have the privacy, they have the means. And, and you know, the confidence of the children. And so I feel that we need to, we need to educate our ministers. You, and when I say the highest sense, I'm not talking about, you know, there are just a few. You know, when you talk about, is this a better old adage, one bad apple can spoil the whole pack. Right. Well, I, I think that uh, we need to make sure that we educate our ministers on educating the church and making sure that they, they're they open. You know, if you're open and talking about something, you can do something about it. 
like Weinstein, if nobody had did, ever been open and said anything about it, it would have gone. He would have gone to his grave. Right. Now, for the ministers listening to this show, because you know there's got to be a few, if they're in agreement, yeah, we need we need to talk. Start talking about this in church. Where do you advise that minister who's listening? Where do you go? Where do you start? Where do you find someone to start bringing this kind of sexuality education into the church? Well, I yeah, I think that once once you start talking about it, you, you yeah, they'll find that uh, many of their most of their congregation need it. You know, many of our seniors need sexual health education. You know, we, you know, they they aren't having sex because you know they've gotten a certain we have, they've gotten a certain age. We have sexual dysfunction as you know, as we get older. You know, that may be the desire goes, but then you know there are places you go and clinics you go and things you can go to improve that. But if you're top, the minister needs to know about these things so they can. Send the teenagers to the right place and let them know that just because they're feeling all of these, having all these feelings, and all, that that's not wrong. What's wrong is when you abuse it. And you abuse it, it's when you go out having sex with somebody with no responsibility. It's got to be honest. You've got to make sure uh, you're educated and empowered and that you use the proper protection and be responsible. And you know, I think you know when when you get older and get and 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 get married. Let's say, well, you know, I think couples we haven't even taught our young couple, young people, or our married couples how to talk about sex in a relationship. You know, we just don't talk about it; we just do it. And so that, I, so so we've got a long way to go. This is a topic that we've just begun to open up to really begin to to talk about it enough to even say we're talking about it and we've not and they're they're beginning to put books and things out about it we, you know now what it's only in the past 10 years we've even talked about lgbtq you know we just didn't talk about it people didn't even know what it was but you know and so i'm just saying that we've just got so much to learn such a long way to go so much to do and all to improve uh, all of our lives. I know you're fancy, and I know you've been eyeing some of those luxury sex toys, haven't you, you frisky little fox? Well, I also know that you enjoy a good discount, don't you, dear? You now can get 20% off your entire order, plus free shipping, at luxury sex toy retailer Lalo.com with discount code SUNNY. Yes, dear, you heard me right. 20% off anything your little heart or, well, <clears throat> other parts. Desire at Lelo.com using discount code SUNNY. Yes, dear, you can thank me later. Oh, I love your tattoos. Did you get them done at a real shop? Did it hurt? These are things that we hear all the time when people meet us for the first time in real life because they notice all the great tattoos that we have. Our ink has been seen in tattoo magazines, movies, and on TV. We get the majority of our tattoos at Old Town Tattoo right here in Chicago. The building they are in is an old funeral home and they are the only haunted tattoo parlor in the world. Old Town Tattoo has been seen in a number of ghost TV shows, including Ghost Slab on the Discovery Channel and America's Most Terrifying on the Travel Channel. They have a bunch of artists that can do anything from grayscale to vibrant color to old school art. Check out their work at OldTownTattoo.com. That's O-L-D-T-O-W-N-T-A-T-U.com. They're located at 3313 West Irving Park Road in Chicago, and you can call them at 773-442-8288 to book an appointment. Tell them Ken and Sonny sent you. Castle Megastore. Once you see their sex toys, you'll want more. I have no idea if Castle Megastore actually has a theme song, but I really dig Castle Megastore. So that's my gift to you, Castle, your very own theme song. And you listeners get a gift, too. If you go to CastleMegastore.com and use discount code SUNNY, that's S-U-N-N-Y, when you check out, you will receive 20% off your order. That's amazing! 
Ding! Castle Megastore. When you get your sex toys, you'll be on the floor because you'll be using them so much and they'll be so awesome and you'll save so much money. You'll get more than one and then you'll climax for a really long time and you'll just be passed out and you'll be like, oh my God, give me water. That was the best orgasm ever. We have a couple of questions here that have nothing to do with sex or okay. sexuality at all. And Sonny and I were just talking before the beginning of the podcast. And you know, sometimes you have these questions like you see the person in the toll booth and you're wondering, how does that person go pee? Because they don't <laughs> yeah. have anywhere to go. We're thinking, all right, you're a Surgeon General. Do you have? Did you have to leave your house in Arkansas and move to Washington, D.C. and get a house there? Or could you fly back and forth between oh, no. like uh, Little Rock and D.C.? Oh, of course not. I mean, we moved, my husband and I, we both moved to D.C. And we, have, and we had a house out on the NIH, uh, NIH campus. And, and we, uh, yeah, we enjoyed uh, living there in Bethesda. Uh, so, uh, so it was a good experience for me. I loved being the Surgeon General. I enjoyed it even when I was getting beat on every day. <laughs> I still loved being the Surgeon General. And I felt that it was important to really do things to make a difference in the health of the lives of people. And I feel that sexual health is an important part of health. And if you aren't sexually healthy, you aren't healthy. Mm, those are wise words. Now, one other question. As Surgeon General, you are known for being a proponent of sexual health and right. all of these things. But really, what else does the Surgeon General do from day to day? Well, I know you must have been busy and you had a lot oh, of stuff to be responsible for. Oh, listen, you are absolutely right. The First of all, the Surgeon General is kind of the administrator over... 6,000 of the best trained public health professionals in the world. And so, you know, we were talking about doctors, nurses, veterinarians, nutritionists, uh, epidemiologists, all, you know, like the people at the CDC. So, you're, and you're, the Surgeon General is called upon, you know, when you have an epidemic, like the Zika epidemic, the HIV AIDS mm -hmm. epidemic. Uh, you know, if we have a flu epidemic, a measles epidemic, you, you are called upon to combat and work and, and make a difference in those kind of epidemics. The Surgeon General is also called upon to try and improve health, try and make sure we have good health, a good health care all over, you know, all over the country. You know, we can, you may have the best health in your neighborhood, in your city, but then there are many people in rural areas who do not have access to quality health care. And uh, we know that our health care, as it is in America, costs too much, delivers too little, and too many people. We have, what, 16 to 17 percent of our population do not even have access to health care. And when you think of access, you got to think of financial access, uh, a, a provider access, you know, you know, there may be lots of providers, but we've got too many specialists and not enough generalists. So, and we've got to make sure we have cultural access and transportation access. So we have to have all of those. So the Surgeon General is out working in mm -hmm. all of those areas. And, of course, for a long while, you know, the Surgeon General worked very hard in reducing uh, uh, you know, smoking. And I think, you know, many of the Surgeon General's you know, yeah, you know, they spent a lifetime. I think you're know, really working on. Uh, you know, we all kind of known for, for different things, but you know, like the like the hoop. You know, he. I think we looked looked at him as. You know, he came out and put out the book on HIV AIDS, and uh, and and Dr. Novella really led the fight. You know, and, and very involved in reducing cigarette smoking uh, and how to crush. Camel. So I'm saying that the each each of each surgeon general has kind of had a different, you know. And, and earlier, you know, there were surgeon generals who really worked on trying to wipe out syphilis. And I think I don't know, remember who it was. One of the other surgeon generals said, "If we had taken the handbook that they had put out for the soldiers in 1930s when they were trying to get rid of syphilis and passed it out." When HIV first became a problem, we wouldn't have had to change anything but the word. But that's because we we didn't do what it said. We haven't learned anything, and we've got to learn. The Surgeon General we've got was trying to educate the public 
on how to be healthy. We need to we have exercise. We need to have good nutrition. Uh, we need to make sure we eat three meals, three snacks, reduce our saturated fats in our diet, to not drink more than, don't drink excessively, two, two drinks a day for men and one for women, not engage in risky sexual behaviors. And we're pushing drive, driving safely. And also we need to protect, always pushing against protection against disease. There's another thing that you're they're pretty well known for, and I have to say the current administration, uh, my family in particular, feels very targeted. Like we have a kind of a trifecta of people that the Trump administration are picking on because I'm Jewish, Sonny is black, yeah. and our youngest child is gay. So we have yeah. we, we feel very <laughs> hated by that. And in addition to that, I, I medicinally use marijuana. And one of yeah. the things that you're very well known for, and I think you're one of the first people, and just thank you again for coming out with all of these issues uh, and, and well, bringing yeah. them to light. But you are like the the first public official that I was aware of that said anything about, in if, if I can quote you here, the unjust prohibition of marijuana has done more damage to public health than has marijuana itself. What is your, Absolutely. What is your take on what's going on with the current laws of, you know, like with Colorado and Washington State and California legalizing. I think that, I think they're slowly, I think they're slowly changing. In fact, 29 states have approved already medical marijuana and they're going to change. And what nine, eight or nine states or more have even made, you know, have approved it across the board. All we've done with marijuana is made us the world's fattest jailer. We've got more people in prison. For smoking marijuana, you know, marijuana, and you know, and so I think many of our you know, our unjust marijuana laws have not done anything but criminalized our young people. I just can't believe that Jeff Sessions, the current Attorney General, is kind of taking things back to you know, like the 1950s. It's just ridiculous to me that oh, you know, this thing that's ridiculous. a medicine. I'm, I have a seizure disorder, and literally cannabis is the only thing that works because they had me on. Tegretol and carpazepam and a bunch of other stuff that had all these right. terrible negative side effects, but cannabis works. As I said, twenty nine states and more and more states, probably very soon, every state will certainly have, have approved medical marijuana. And I think the only the thing where we've shown that it really hit because in in adolescents who use large quantities for long periods of time. Have they shown that they probably aren't as smart as they might have been? And I think that that, but they've not shown any real detrimental effects on adults. Look at alcohol. Yeah, exactly. It, just think about alcohol. Think about some of the other, uh, you know, some of the other. Look, look at how many, how many marijuana has never killed anybody. But look, look at how many people that the opioids are killing. Oh my goodness, yes. So I'm saying that we've not really thought very critically and carefully sometime about what we're doing. We're wrapping up and we really want to thank you for talking with us. I think it's oh, it's, it's, pleasure. it's so important for everybody, adults, teens, children, to be open and frank and to hear somebody of your stature and, and somebody who is so well respected and so well known to say these things out loud. But before we go, we want to get to know Dr. Elders just on just you, just on a fun basis. So if you would <laughs> indulge us in a couple of questions, okay. we want to see what you like the best. Dr. Elders, cake or pie? Oh, gee. Pie. <laughs> oh, my answer would be both. Okay. Oh, no, and I, Ken's yeah, clapping. Well, my, answer, my answer is both. But if, you, if I had to choose, I chose. Yeah, Ken's clapping. For our wedding, we didn't have a wedding cake. By his request, we had wedding pie. So, Oh, very good. <laughs> All right, okay. Dr. Elders, Pepsi or Coke? Pepsi or Coke? Yeah. Oh, jeez. Uh, I'll drink both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and here, here's here's one. Waffle House or Denny's? Waffle House. Oh, yeah. He's clapping again. <laughs> uh, cats or dogs? Oh, dogs. Dogs. All right. Oh, oh! everybody who knows me knows about my job. So Aww. It is that I dislike cats. It's that I love dogs. 
Oh, see, you you are you are my husband's answers all the way. I'm the, I'm oh, the cake well. and cat and Denny's person, and he's like, uh-huh. oh, yeah. What breed of dog is Job? Job, Job was uh, a German Shepherd. Oh, and and listen, I I, I had three different ones. They, they, Oh, yeah, during my, they were my son's dogs and they became mine. But Job had a stricture of his esophagus and I had to pet, buy a uh, insure and, 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 and dog food and grind it up. And I wore out three blenders fixing Job meals th- twice a day. Oh, how sweet. And Job lived to be 12. Wow. And, and, uh, and we, and, and, and we were just, and, you know, and he was a big dog and, but, but, but he had, he had the stricture of his esophagus from the time we got him as a puppy. Aww. Sweet. So all his life, we were going, we, first we're going to, to bed, to the vet and getting him dilated. Then that didn't work. And, and then, so then we just started feeding and they was going to put him to sleep. And then we, so, you know, we, uh, they said bring him back. Well, you know, after you've had him and done all of that for six months, you, a bunch, you, you know, the idea of bringing him back doesn't even enter your brain. Aww. Aww. So, so we, so we just, we just kept Job until, un, until he finally died. And I, we made sure, and, and, and people teased me and said, well, that's notice when you travel, you have to take your vet with you. My vet became the state veterinarian. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> So that leaves me with one last question. You brought up your son. What's it like to have Dr. Elders as a mom? Sometimes good and sometimes bad. (laughs) (laughs) I I think most of the time they're proud to have me as a mom. And then there are times when they wish that I could disappear for a while. Well, that, you know what that means? That means you're what? a good mom. Oh, oh, does it? Oh, <laughs> if there okay. are some times where they're like, yeah, uh, you're exactly. doing your job. <laughs> well, that, sometimes you have to do that. And sometimes you, have, it's, it's, sometimes you have to pass out a little tough love. Exactly. Well, again, Dr. Elders, thank you so much for this conversation. We uh, appreciate oh, it so much. Oh, it's, it was a pleasure. You know, I, the thing that I'm really promoting right now is I think... I'm really very strongly promoting comprehensive sexuality health education for everybody. And I really feel that we've got to educate our doctors. And in fact, we established a chair in sexual health education for physicians at the University of Minnesota. They've established a Jocelyn Elders chair at the University of Arkansas. And we're going to have, there, we're going to have one of other places. So we're, we've got to improve our sexuality, health education in this country if we're going to make a difference. Amen. Absolutely. Thank you for all the work you do, Dr. Elders. Uh, uh, Thank you. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to American Sex. To keep up with Ken and I, we'll first make sure you watch our TV show, Sex with Sunny Megatron, on Showtime. Then visit SunnyMegatron.com. There you can learn more about us, read our blog, peruse our workshop calendar, or hire us. For what? Well, either for private coaching, or to book us to teach at your event or university, or as sex and relationship writers for your publication. Oh, and don't forget, we're on social media, too. I'm the super social one, so you can find me as Sunny Megatron on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, my YouTube channel, and a bunch of other places. But if you want to get me on Snapchat, you got to look for Sunny underscore Megatron, and you can follow Ken on Twitter at at tag PsyChicken. That's P-S-Y-C-H-I-C-K-E-N. Also, please support us by shopping with the affiliates and sponsors from our breaks. And if you contribute to our Patreon, we're going to love you forever. Well, we're going to love you forever anyway, but just go with it. Lastly, if you like this broadcast, tell people about it. Tweet it, Facebook status it, and rate it on iTunes and other platforms. Thanks, friends. We'll see you next week on American Sex.